Lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live via Skype in England with James Jacob Prash. Uh, Jacob, one of the believers had a question. He's witnessing to someone, um, and it's based on 2 Kings 2.24. Why would Elijah curse a, a, a gang of youths for mocking his baldness um, when he could have just turned the other cheek? Thank you for your question. There are two aspects of it. One aspect is something you should not even attempt to share with an unbeliever or, an, or a new believer. It has a very, very deep meaning, prophetically and eschatologically, for the last days. We address this passage in the book Harpezo. Remember, Elijah, Elisha, John the Baptist have the same spirit, and there's a significance to that number 42. After Elijah goes, what happens to his spirit? The 42, it has a relationship to 42 months and so forth. I can't explain it now, and it would be totally impertinent to witnessing to an unbeliever. I'm simply making you aware of it. If you want to understand this passage in its depth, you need to be referred to the book Harpezo and, and read the exegesis of the passage um, as it applies prophetically and eschatologically for the last days. There's that depth of meaning, but that's nothing for an unbeliever. Now, for a non-believer, this is a fulfillment of Proverbs 17.12. Proverbs 17.12. It is better to meet a bear robbed of her cubs, female bear, than a fool in his folly. The term fool, lechon, clown, it's not just somebody who's a foolish person or a, or, or a clown or somebody who's not serious. It's someone with the spirit of mockery someone with a spirit of mockery. This spirit of mockery is not simply directed against Elijah. It's directed against the Lord. They mock him for his boldness. Karachat. Karachat. In the New Testament, we see a woman has hair as a covering, as an emblem of her being under the protective authority of her husband, father, male leadership of the church, or whatever, which is a reflection of Christ being the head of the church as the husband is the head of the wife. There is the hair. A male not having the hair means that his direct headship is Christ. His direct headship is Christ, where Christ works through the husband to provide spiritual direction to the wife and through the male leadership of the congregation to present leadership and guidance to the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, a man should not have his head covered. So there's a meaning to the mockery spiritually, if you can follow what I'm saying. They were not just making fun of an old man which was cruel and disrespectful to, to the elderly or the aging. There was that aspect, but that's not all they were doing. They were mocking things spiritual. The relationship that Elisha had as a prophet with God. These were fools in their folly, and they met the bear. Now Elisha did not unleash the bears from a cage. He simply cursed them. The bears came at them. Uh, God sent the bears. First of all, we are under the Torah. We are not under the covenant of grace. The New Testament was not given yet. There was no such teaching as turn the other cheek, as it were, not return evil for evil in the Old Testament. Under the law, that was not there. The law was the law of judgment. It was the law of wrath. The only reason we are not under that wrath or that judgment of God is because Jesus died in our place. That's the only reason. But the anger of God is still there. The judgment for sin is still there. Only Christ took it in the place of a believer. 
you can tell this unsaved person you're witnessing to that if he has shown irreverence towards those speaking the word of God, he's co-equally guilty with those 42 youths, fools in their folly. And the only reason the bears haven't devoured him in a matter of speaking is because Jesus died in his place under the covenant of grace, under the new covenant, he has a chance to repent and believe the gospel. Otherwise, a day of reckoning will surely come. He will give account for his sin. Well, that is true of all of us. That is the difference. You cannot apply the law of grace to the law of Moses, to the Torah. The Torah is not per se grace. There are elements of grace in it, but it is not the law of grace. It is the law of the law. It is God's standard. It is only in the New Covenant where we see this turn the other cheek. You're applying something juridically to a different legal system with a different legal code at a different time in history. It just doesn't work. But there is a spiritual meaning to it. Yes, they were mocking an old man and that angers God. But nonetheless, it was beyond that. They were mocking him for his karahat, for his baldness, his headship. Spiritual meaning in it. Better to meet a bear robbed of her cubs than a fool in his folly. Well, the fools met the bear robbed of their cubs, as it were. It was an application and a fulfillment of what we read in Proverbs 17, 12, as authored by Solomon. Remember, Elisha did not call the bears or release them from a cage as, 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 as animals of attack in retribution for what they did. God sent the bears. Elisha simply called out to God and spoke under divine inspiration a curse against the 42. Then God unleashed the judgment. Again, this has a deep meaning for the last days against the 42 dealt with in the book Harpezo. Uh, but Elisha didn't actually unleash those bears. That was the hand of God. Thank you so much for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, 
Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo. All available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.